So I salute each and every one with the honorable and the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. May they be multiplied unto you. We welcome you to community leadership training that's hosted by Fellowship Community Full Gospel Church under the leadership of Bishop Jackson and T.L. Elliott Ministries under the leadership of myself, Archbishop Elliott. Amen. So in that, here this afternoon, it's a blessing that we can continue to teach not only leaders, but the body of Christ, those things that we believe are foundational, those things that we believe are core to our belief system, so that as we continue to not only grow in our relationship in the Lord, we're able to develop our relationship to be able to lead people based on scripture, based on what thus saith the Lord. And as I say lead, let me make sure that I clarify to each and every one the word lead, whether we're talking Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, and believe it or not, even in our Western world culture, means to influence. Many people, are kind of stunt on their growth in doing things for the Lord because they feel that they can't do it unless they have a title in front of their name or behind their name. Uh, and without that, they say, well, I can't do anything. But I emphasize leadership is about being able to influence others. If we have the ability to speak a word or say something, especially with passion and conviction, that people, when they hear you speak, are moved and excited to do what you're saying, then you're tapping into your capability of being a leader. But we pray that it is forever for the service of the Lord God in all things. Amen. So with that being said, uh, I digress uh, from the subject per se, of leaders to the subject at hand. And the subject at hand that we're discussing is consecration of church leadership. Amen. Consecration of church leadership. Um, today, we're in part two of this series that I am doing on consecration of church leadership. But I believe, and I, I, I think all other leaders under the sound of my voice say this is a significant area that needs to be clarified, especially in the church, because we so loosely lose, use excuse me terms like consecrate, and some people that are listening either know or they don't know, and I believe there's a lot of leaders that we have in the body of Christ that either mantle themselves apostolically, episcopally, or whatever denominational background that they have where consecrations occur may not have a depth of knowledge on consecration to be the most effective in delivering that to the body of Christ. Uh, we understand, unfortunately, some people, as we say, freelance. They kind of do their own thing. Uh, but if anything that we do in the name of the Lord, we need to do our best to at least be scriptural or foundational in what we do, why we do, when we do, where we do, and how we do. If there's no resemblance of the Lord God's word in that, then it begins to draw question. And if we're not careful, I'm not saying that some things that are done when it comes to consecrating are wrong, but I will say if we're not careful and we don't do our best to foundationalize it scripturally, then we will lean to our own understanding and oftentimes our flesh will get involved and the Lord God is not in it in any shape, form, or fashion. It may look good, but it's not godly. If I can put it, you know, plain and crystal clear. So in that, we want to make sure, which is why we're doing leadership training and making it available to anybody and everybody that's willing to listen. We don't have all the answers. I will say that up front. 
However, what answers we do have, we uh, do our best to shape it according to what the scripture says for interpretation and for implementation. Amen? So, as I say that, part one, if I may do just a bit of a recap, because for those that may be joining today's part, part two, you may not have all the nuggets of part one. And as I did part one on consecration of church leadership, one of the things that I focused on, first of all, is as I said here a moment ago, giving scriptural foundation to consecration. Uh, the scriptures that I addressed were Exodus chapter 28, verse 3, verse 41, Exodus chapter 30, verse 30. Um, and then I listed out on consecration or being consecrated verses or books in the Old Testament, excuse me, where we find the word consecrate reference. As I mentioned um, in the Old Testament, you find it referenced in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, First and Second Kings. First and second, Chronicles, Ezra, Ezekiel, and Micah. And in the New Testament, we find it referenced in the book of Hebrews. In the same turn, I took the time to articulate what is consecration because I believe as the Lord has led me when it comes to teaching anything regarding the word of the Lord, there's always six elements that we look to address who, what, when, where, why, and how. And in that, we took the time to look at what is consecration. Amen. To define it as the act of declaring or dedicating something or someone sacred or exclusively to the service of the Lord God and his church and to associate oneself to the use of divine power, meaning divine influence and ability. That is the culmination of what we're understanding, conse what consecration is. Amen. We examined what were the different words in the Bible for consecration, and I brought to everyone's attention that there are three significant Hebrew words in the Old Testament, Kadesh, Yad, and Malay. And in the New Testament, two significant words, Ganizo and Karam. All of these are associated with consecration from different aspects. Amen. And the last thing that I addressed, I believe, was who should be consecrated. As we took the time to understand what consecration is, based on those comments that I just gave you, the next question was who fits in the category of being consecrated. And as a reminder to each and every one under the sound of my voice, whether you knew this or not, we understand when it comes to consecrating to determine who when it comes to human beings, we're referring to those individuals who not only live a sanctified life, but are now being exclusively giving themselves to dedicated service unto the Lord, which is why for those in the church, when we hear this terminology being used about being consecrated, we notice that it is mostly used when it comes to leadership in the church mm -hmm. because those who are leaders in the church are not just trying to focus specifically on living a sanctified individual life. They're also saying not only am I focusing on a sanctified or a holy life, like each and every person in the church or in the body of Christ, but I am also committing myself 
or dedicating myself to total service of the Lord beyond me. That means I am now looking at being a consistent influencer for the Lord. And I'm using key words because as I said here a moment ago, a leader is an influencer. So when we look across the landscape of those who are operating, as we say, as leaders in the church, they are individuals who said, the Lord is more to me than just me being uh, uh, focused on myself. I am also focused on the well-being of other individuals in the Lord, and I'm looking at taking the role to help lead them in their sanctified life. This is why we can really understand what is the depth of the function of those, as we say, as bishops, as apostles, uh, uh, as pastors, as deacons and elders, because they're saying that service of the Lord is more than serving myself. Now, I don't want anyone to misinterpret what I am saying here because depending on where people are in their spiritual life, I do not want anyone to think I'm degradating a person that's working on sanctification. That is valuable to each and every individual, including leaders. Amen. And in that, if sanctification is not valued and worked on, unfortunately, we can find that the church can become degraded if people bypass sanctification and only want consecration. I hope everybody's hearing me because that can be something that can break the foundation of the church. It's easy to say we want to be consecrated. But even a baby, if I can use a natural illustration, a baby coming from the womb of the mother does not immediately start running. A baby first has to learn to crawl, then to walk, and then running is the next phase. So as I use that illustration, it's the same thing with the work in the church. Sanctification becomes what we crawl to and walk into so that when we are able and strong enough to walk, we can now register for the race of great service. And at that time, consecration becomes something significant in the life, once again, of a sanctified person. You don't get consecrated to get sanctified. You get sanctified to get consecrated. Hope I've made this clear. So now as new information that I would like to present to you on today, I began to address another question out of the six elements, which is why do we need to be consecrated? This should be something based on what I've just stated to you and cause to move around in your head we want to make sure as believers that without a shadow of a doubt, we not only know what consecration is and who needs to be consecrated, but see one of the, if I may use the term, selling factors for an individual to stay dedicated to consecration is them being able to answer within themselves why they want to be consecrated. Why do I need to be consecrated? What is the fringe benefits of being consecrated? If, if, if I may still put that in simplicity, because everybody under the sound of my voice, I want you to be, be really, if I may say, sold to this, that you say, I want to be consecrated unto the Lord. I don't want to just, just live 
uh, sanctified and only focus on me, I also want to be enlisted to the continued service of the Lord. Because re remember, I, I think I said this before and I'll say it again. I want it to be really uh, 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 drilled into the hearing of each and every individual. It requires you to be sanctified or living a sanctified life in order to posture you or qualify you for consecration. If I'm living a sanctified life, it's the Lord says, based on the lifestyle that you're living, I can now give you the invitation, what we call the calling of ministry on the next level, whether it's to be a licensed preacher, whether it's to operate under, as we say, episcopally, holy orders as a bishop or as a elder slash priest, because in some denominational faiths, elder and priest are one in the same. They just use different terminology. Or if you're called to be a deacon to the church, you're under holy orders. If anyone is to receive the call or the invitation for the giftings in the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor and teacher. Mm -hmm. These are for the perfecting or the maturing of the saints, as we know in Ephesians chapter four. So in saying all of that. We can't just want to have those identities without also knowing and having a passion to live up to what those identities represent, not only to the Lord, but also to the church and to the world. Because the world doesn't know what they don't have unless the church is representing the Lord God in the totality to let them know what a spiritual lifestyle looks like. So as I say that, then it brings me to why do we need to be consecrated? Amen. So let me begin to address scripturally those things that show why we need to be consecrated. First thing I would like to take you to scripturally is in the book of Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. In Leviticus eleven forty-four, the scripture says, and I'm reading from the standard King James version, it says, for I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore Sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So, in reading Leviticus 11.44... One reason why we need to be consecrated, especially as leaders in the church or leaders to the body of Christ, is because the consecration identifies our holiness. The consecration is, uh, uh, should I say, the thought and action that shows the world that we are now dedicated to being holy without it being compromised, without it being up for discussion. This is what we are saying going forward until eternity comes or until our dying day, our last breath, we have dedicated ourselves to a life of sacredness. We've dedicated our lives to being separated for the Lord. We've dedicated our life 
to not be one chasing after worldliness, but completely chasing after godliness in everything we do, everything we say, all of the actions of our lifestyle is going to be molded or inquiring after being in the holiness or the sacredness of the Lord God. In that, based upon this one verse as well, the reason why we seek to be consecrated is not only for holiness, but also to separate ourselves from those things that defile our holiness unto the Lord. See, based upon the action that we do, it makes an enunciation unto the world as to what we're saying we're committed to. Let me make this simple for some that are listening to me. Think about this. People that are married. Why do you think that you have a marriage ceremony? Other than the fact to acknowledge to the world you have chosen someone else that you're dedicated to and you even wear a wedding, wedding ring, excuse me, to say that you are off limits or you're not on the market for selection anymore. Because as long as you're wearing that and as long as your mindset is to be dedicated to, as we say in our Western culture, your other half, I don't need you as an outsider to try to influence me to adultery, to fornication, to anything outside of what's honorable to the relationship that I have now committed to. So with saying that, it's the same thing with being consecrated. Consecrated is making an enunciation to everyone that knows the dedication of the individual is not to be willingly tampered with to pull them out of being dedicated to the Lord that they've committed their life to. I hope that makes sense. Amen. Let me give you another reason why we need to be consecrated. Turn with me to the book of James, chapter 4, and verse 17. And I'm actually going to carry you to a second passage as well regarding this definition, as I believe, as to why we need to be consecrated, but for the moment. In James 4, 17, it says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Okay, now I want you to hold, hold that in your thought. Let me read it to you once more. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, for those that know what's spiritually right or spiritually beneficial, but then you don't do it, meaning you know what's right, but you don't do it, the Bible says that's sin. That's errored or flawed thinking. Now, turn with me quickly to Numbers chapter 6. Taking you back to the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 6, Verses 7 and 8. Matter of fact, let me read verse 6 in conjunction with that. It says, all the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. Now this is in correlation to the separation of, uh, as we would say, the Nazaritic vow. Amen. For those who know a little bit about 
the Old Testament, the view of the Nazarite was still a priestly separation for the Lord. Amen. Then it says, he shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die. Because the consecration of his God is upon his head. Okay. Verse 8. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. Okay. Now, I know those under the sound of my voice are saying, what, what are you saying here? Okay. According to Numbers, under the Nazaritic vow of separation or consecration unto the Lord, it is not in the sense that consecration unto the Lord is conditional. What am I referring to? Okay. Based upon what is being articulated here in the book of Numbers, you can't act consecrated to some folk and then other folk you not consecrate it. Ah. Your consecration has to be consistent. So, so if you remember as I gave in James, when you know right, you got to do right at all times. So, then I have to understand that consecration for me, is not conditional as an individual to say I'm only consecrated at certain times. My consecration going forward is all the time. Uh, 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 see, I'm trying, I'm trying to make this as clear as I can. Because, once again, as I said here earlier, it's easy for somebody to say, I want to be consecrated. But do you know the price of consecration when it comes to leadership? Because this is a vow of separation, just like the vow of the Nazarite. So, so in saying that, why do we need to be consecrated Based upon what we can extrapolate and meditate on out of these verses, consecration will cause us to refuse to do common things that interfere with the divine standards set for us by the Lord and his word. I cannot afford to let common things or worldly things or fleshly things compromise my sanctification and service unto the Lord. I've heard many leaders, they would usually say, I can't afford my anointing to be tainted. And, and that's really speaking towards one who has a consecrated mindset. So hopefully this speaks in volumes to leaders that are under the sound of my voice. How valuable you are when it comes to consecration. There's a mindset that you have to transition to that's not just you're having the fanfare of an event that's done before people. You are now saying here going forward, I am married to the service of the Lord. I'm not shacking with the service. I'm married to the service. Let me give you some more scripture. A man asked to why we need to be consecrated, if that's all right. Let me take you to a familiar book in the Old Testament. The book I'm referring to is Exodus. 
It's a very profound book. In Exodus chapter 28, verse 3, I like what this verse has to say. In Exodus 28, 3, the Bible says, and thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. The Lord says you'll speak or dialogue with those who's got divine wisdom operating in their inner man, in our heart, in their mind. Amen. That they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him. Now listen to this. That he may minister unto me. In the priest's office. The Bible says. That the guidance that was given unto Moses was that not only was Aaron's garments made sacred, but the scripture says that he is to also be consecrated so that he can minister, watch this, not to folks, but minister to the Lord in the priest's office. How many want to talk to God any old kind of way and ain't got no consecration on them? If I'm going to be the priest, if I'm going to be the elder, if, if I'm going to be the bishop, if, if I'm going to be the apostle, listen, listen very closely. The Bible says not only are the garments consecrated, but the individual is consecrated so they can minister unto the Lord. People like to minister, but are they really only ministering to people but not to God? This becomes something significant as to one of the purposes that consecration is necessary. Am I talking truth right now? Can I give you a little, little more on that? Still in the book of Exodus. Even if we turned back to chapter 19, verse 22. In Exodus 19, 22, the Bible says, And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. Meaning burst out in violence or anger against them. As we often say, it's a terrible thing to face an angry God. So being in order deems consecration being something necessary for our service unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
as I say as a point, this means as another answer as to why we need to be consecrated is consecration permits us to minister to and for the Lord. I know some will say, well, you're talking Old Testament. What does the new have to say about it? I like how Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 5 doesn't say that directly but here's revelation that we grab it says and this they did not as we hoped but first gave their selves to the Lord meaning they dedicated themselves or consecrated themselves unto the Lord and unto us by the will of God or by the desire it is in the Lord God's will that we're not only sanctified to him, but that we're given to him in complete service. So we can pull that here from 2 Corinthians to really invest in the thought and the belief that we as leaders in the body of Christ if we're going to influence others, it's a uh, it's something that we will desire to do, but in the desire of giving full service to him, of being more than just sanctified, it's in the will of the Lord God for us to arrive to that. See, what I'm trying to emphasize to you is that as the Lord invites us to being leaders for him, influencers for him, it's also a dangerous place for us to get comfortable of where we're at and saying, I don't want to do all that. Y'all with me? Yes, sir. Let me give you another point regarding why we need to be consecrated. If I may carry you back to the Old Testament in the book of Psalms, in Psalms chapter 51. I like how, as we believe, David being the psalm writer for this particular chapter. I like how the chapter actually talks about consecration, whether people realize it or not. And when you look at verses 2 through 14, if I may read them to you quickly, it says, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Now I can all see, li listen, listen, listen. Consecration now. This is, if I may say, almost the prayer or acknowledgement of an individual that's going into being consecrated. If anybody want to know what the mindset of the individual is, this is an individual saying, Lord, this is why I want to be consecrated. I'm, I'm exposing to you my thought 
as I examine my own life, my own faults that may be hindrances from me being consecrated. I may be on the sanctified journey, but there's some things that I've got to acknowledge. You, you got to understand. See, repentance is something that also comes to the forefront, even in the transition of sanctification to consecration. And in that, if an individual is not in the mindset to lead, maybe they're not ready. Because the, these, these are some things, if someone really is looking on the verge of consecration, then somebody need to revisit Psalms 51, if you're hearing me. So what does he say here? If you were putting yourself in this position before you were getting ready to get consecrated, you would be like David and say, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, from my, my unrighteous actions. And cleanse me from my ungodly thinking. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Meaning, while I'm in this earthen vessel, no matter how sanctified I've gotten, I can still see fault in myself or I'm not to arrive that this earthen vessel does not have defects. Verse 4, against thee, thee only, have I sinned. My sin is not based upon other folks. My sin is based upon my error thinking of not thinking according to the commandments or the word of the living God being how I should frame my thoughts and actions. It says, against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. Oh, that's. Or should I say, behold, I was twisted. I was disconfigured. I, I was contorted or wounded in my iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part. Be, let me put that in layman's term. Behold, the Lord God desires for you to be dedicated to truth in your inner man, in your inner thoughts. Behold, the Lord desires for you to be consecrated to him in your inward man. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom because the Based on what David says here, it's the inner man that the Lord gives wisdom to. It's not your external, it's your internal. It's based upon the spiritual wisdom that you get on the inside of you that transforms the outside of you. It's based on you being consecrated inwardly that makes your outward consecration real. Verse 7, he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. I need you to give me a medication, Lord, that's going to clean me. I need you to give me an antibiotic. I, 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 I need a medication that's going to clean up what has infected my inner man because my inner man has not lived a consecrated life. See, the reality of the matter, when I live a sanctified life, the sanctification is something that now works as, uh, if I may say, your daily probiotic to continue to keep you in a healthy state for your consecration in him. Okay. He says, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. 
Create in me a clean heart. See, uh, my consecration is part of my recreation. The Bible says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew the right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because remember, consecration is something that's necessary because the Bible says, be consecrated for I am holy. It's part of your holiness. A, a, a consecration is something that is a catalyst for making us eligible for the presence of the Lord God. Just like as we said here before, as we looked at some of the previous scriptures, even if we're going to function as leaders and be the influencer, the Lord wants us to be able to approach him. Now, I'm not saying individuals can't seek the face of God. I don't want anybody to misinterpret because we know that we all have the ability to go before the Lord in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. However, once again, there's a higher standard for those who are functioning as leaders. We can't just uh, get comfortable as to going to him any kind of way. There is now a level that we say, I am going to be in a, uh, a, a spirituality of excellence when I get into his presence. The Bible says, verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Not, take not thy sacredness from me. Amen. Verse 12, restore unto me the joy of the salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy way. How am I going to teach him or how am I going to teach them his way if I'm not living his way? And sinners shall be converted unto thee. It takes the consecrated lifestyle of leaders to show people who aren't living a sanctified life what it looks like to live a holy life so that they have a desire to be converted and start sanctification. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Because see, as long as, long as we're not living sanctified, and as long as we're not, as leaders, living a consecrated life unto him, there's blood on our hands. That's what the scripture says. I'm blood guilty. So based on this, another reason why we need to be consecrated is because consecration will assist with deepening our relationship and knowledge, or should I say spiritual understanding of Christ as sacred leaders unto him. Amen. I'm going to give you two more. Two more nuggets on this. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Romans. In the book of Romans, there's two verses that I want to touch regarding why we need to be consecrated. In verse 13, it says, Neither yield ye your members 
as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. All right? Meaning, neither give up, i.e. it's saying, don't give up or give your flesh the satisfaction of your actions being in service to your sin. But the Bible says, but yield yourselves unto God. And, and as we say yield, it means dedicate yourselves, sanctify yourselves, or consecrate yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Me meaning those who were, as Paul says, there are many that are dead in Christ. He says, now Activate your spirituality so that you aren't the living dead walking around. You have to be consecrated, giving yourself over to the Lord so that the spirit that's inside of you that's still operating your body now becomes alive. As the Bible says, as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So when I dedicate myself unto the Lord, when I consecrate myself unto the Lord, then one of the reasons why is so that every function, every limb, every action that I do is for the service of the Lord God versus to accommodate or serve my flesh or my hidden humanistic agendas. Are y'all with me? Still in that same chapter, jump down to verse 19. In verse 19, it says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmities of your flesh. The writer says, I speak to you to deal with fleshly matters because your flesh has gotten in the way. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. The writer says, I need to deal with you because you, you, you're living a type of consecrated life, but your life is consecrated to unrighteous things. You have officially committed yourself to continued service to your flesh. Then he says, even so now, yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness, meaning if you have the ability to be consecrated to your flesh, if I'm coming to you representing to the Lord and you are to be converted and you are to begin to live a life of sanctification, then you could be consecrated unto the Lord just as good if not better than you were when you was consecrated to your flesh. What does that say to us? Then this, consecration will assist with growing into a divine lifestyle based on your commitment to the service of the Lord, Christ, and the Holy Spirit versus your commitment to your flesh. I'm going to give you one more, one more as to why we need to be consecrated. This is one I've been churning for those that have participated in the voice as a foundation scripture, but I think leaders need to hear it as well. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. In Joshua 3, 5, here's, 
here's something that I really want you to grab because the term that's used here is sanctification. Remember, as I said, sanctification is the beginning phase that transitions us to a place of being fully dedicated and fully usable in service to the Lord, known as consecration. But there's some things that you, you have to understand why sanctification is still significant to consecration. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says, And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Hmm. What's significant about that? Well, I like how the verse uses the word wonders. Wonders out of the Hebrew is pale, which, as we would say, distinct acts, distinct actions, or distinct events. But when you really look at that word and exhaust its meaning, it's distinct act or actions or events for the sake of one's separation. For the sake of one's sanctification to bring them into a place where they can be consecrated. Once again, consecration is something that I need because it is something that will validate my effectiveness of living a sanctified life unto the Lord. See, some people, when you, when you do some things, I'm not saying that everybody is looking for a badge of approval with any and everything that you do. But just like people that have jobs, Depending on what you do, notice that some people's jobs at the end of the year, if your job performance was good, then they like to award you, not reward you. They want to award you. And the award gives you recognition that the reward that they've been paying you, the paycheck for your labor, yeah. is recognizing, watch this, that you haven't done the standard job. The award that you're given at the end of, as we would say, a job rating period, is to acknowledge how you have done your job in excellence for you to become eligible for the next level. Why do I say it like that? Because even in sanctification, we don't want to be mediocre being sanctified people. I know right but I don't live right. I'll do right on a couple of things, but uh, I, I, I won't do right on everything. It's when you have the pride of excellence in what you do that you don't drop the standard, you exceed the standard. And see, when you exceed the standard, that's how those that are above you in your career field See who needs to be called for promotion to be in a greater place. Uh, that's why the Lord calls the sanctified to be consecrated for a greater standard of responsibility. But if you are not doing what's necessary and then some. See, if your passion is real about what you believe, then you won't let 
if I may say from the flesh perspective, your paycheck limit the quality of how you do things. So as kingdom people, when you're really on the journey of sanctification for the Lord, then as leaders, you're not wanting to just be simple. You're wanting to give the best quality so that when the Lord looks for the next candidate to feel the responsibility of being a kingdom influencer, you already qualify, and you ain't just qualifying because of one event that you did. You're qualifying because you lived that lifestyle. So these are, if you want to go to the next level in the Lord, hopefully this is giving you a prophetic tip on what is necessary for you as a believer and a servant of the Lord who wants to serve the Lord by serving his people. Amen. Amen. And a man.